Hey folks, this is Riker, and we've just gotten a new blog post on system design in Diablo 4, in which lead system designer David Kim explains some changes that they are making to itemization based on feedback. We're going to dig into this blog post right now, but in short, we're seeing the devs act very quickly to feedback, changing up decisions that they've made, implementing new systems, and communicating about them very quickly. These are very promising signs, so let's dive right into the blog post. Quote, let's start with two key principles that guide us as the D4 development team. First, we agree that adding depth and customization to your character through itemization is incredibly valuable and important to the game. This has been the most discussed topic since we revealed Diablo 4. Sidebar, and for good reason, my personal feedback video on Diablo 4 is still forthcoming, and every time a new blog post comes out I have to modify what I'm going to say slightly. But as a spoiler, itemization was one thing that I had a question mark on. He goes on to say, to be clear, we believe D4 itemization should be deep and rewarding, and that's one of our highest priorities. Another important philosophy across the whole game for our team is the concept, easy to learn, difficult to master. Now, another sidebar, this has held true for many of Blizzard's past games. They were easy to learn and difficult to master, going all the way back to StarCraft, an incredibly difficult game, but it was easy to learn. You would start off playing StarCraft and you'd feel a sense of accomplishment and progression in your skills, and you thought you were pretty good at the game until your first 1v1 match online on ladder, and that's when you realize you're total garbage and there's still a huge amount of work to do to master this game. Even with Diablo 2, it's a game that felt easy to learn, difficult to master. But then with Diablo 3, it felt easy to learn, and full stop. Let's go on. Second, we agree with the feedback that D4 shouldn't just mimic the itemization in our previous games. Our plan is to take the best part of previous games and improve upon them while introducing new elements to make D4 unique. We don't want to create an exact copy of D2 or D3. It's worth calling out on that subject that there was a lot of mixed feedback on differing opinions, and we acknowledge that means there's no single approach that everyone in the community will agree on. Now, on a personal note, I've seen a lot of people say just remake D2, basically, and they can't just remake D2. We're 20 years post-release of Diablo 2, and if Diablo 4 doesn't try to evolve the genre, then it's never going to be the groundbreaking kind of game that Diablo 2 was. David goes on to say that what follows will be some design changes that they are working on, but they are very early designs, so everything is still subject to change. Affixes in Diablo 4. We went through so much great community discussion, including a fair amount of conflicting feedback, and we've had dozens of hours of discussion on this topic. So the devs had two major takeaways. First, item affixes should be a meaningful part of character power. Second, they should create interesting choices when deciding which items to equip. Our previous focus was on making each affix geared towards specific builds so that the perfect item would vary depending on the build you were pushing. We still like this overall direction, but we understand it can also feel like your choices are limited because you end up chasing a list of best-in-slot items. As an example, if you want to build a Blessed Hammer-based Crusader in Diablo 3, then you have to take all of the items that support Blessed Hammer. So here are some proposed changes. We're increasing the total number of affixes on items, including magic, rare, and legendary items. This should raise the overall importance of non-legendary affixes on your character's overall level of power. There were complaints about seeing so few affixes on gear, so this is a great change. We are also introducing three new stats. Angelic Power, which increases the duration of all beneficial effects, like self-buffs or healing. Demonic Power, which increases the duration of all negative effects, like debuffs or damage over time. And Ancestral Power, which increases the chance of on-hit effects, in other words, increased proc chance. These new stats can appear as affixes, such as plus 15 Angelic Power. In addition to providing the above stated benefit, we want these new stats to also act as prerequisites for empowering certain other affixes. If you don't have enough of a specific power, you can still equip the item, but you may not benefit from an affix linked to that power. Here are a couple of work in progress examples to better illustrate what these affixes do. So here we have a pair of rare boots. They innately give defense, angelic power, move speed, if you have 50 Demonic Power, which this character does not, you would gain plus one rank to the Devastation skill. 
And because this character does have a total of 40 angelic power or more, you gain 25% cold resist. Another example, an amulet, 15% critical strike damage, plus two ranks to char to ash power, if they would have had 60 demonic power, which this character does not, 25% fire resistance, with 55 demonic power, which this character does not have. So these two together, this would be a good item for someone with demonic power. But then also here, 10% crushing blow chance if you have enough ancestral power. Each of the three powers will have a list of affixes that are attuned to it. So depending on which stats you care about, you might want to focus on angelic, demonic, or ancestral power. We think these changes will address two main takeaways pretty well. Legendary powers should no longer completely dwarf the strength of your affixes, and the affixes themselves provide more interesting choices because their strength depends on how much of your relevant powers you've accumulated on the rest of your gear. You might find an amulet with the perfect stats for your build, but some of its affixes may require demonic power when you've previously focused on ancestral. Maybe your current amulet is the primary source of your ancestral power, so equipping a new amulet would mean potentially making sacrifices elsewhere. With this system, it will be easy to identify items with good stats, but it will take some thought and planning to decide whether the item is good for your build. At the same time, we think this system keeps items approachable, even if you make suboptimal itemization decisions. You may be weaker, but doing so won't completely break your character. We can also introduce this mechanic gradually and naturally as you level, rather than making it a requirement to understand at the beginning. There's so much to talk about in this segment right here. But I want to highlight this very last sentence right here. Without necessarily focusing on this one specific mechanic, this is the philosophy that I really feel should be embraced with an action RPG, easy to learn, difficult to master, or as a parallel statement, introduce depth gradually. I certainly understand the desire to make a game that is very accessible, that new players can jump into, not feel overwhelmed, and just start having fun immediately and not feel like they're being punished for not instantly knowing everything about the game. So seeing that the developers are thinking of ways to potentially gradually introduce complexity is very reassuring. As for this specific system, my first reaction to it is very positive. It is a new system. It is more mechanics, it is more depth and complexity. In Diablo 4, it appears that we are doing away with strength, dexterity, intelligence. Those are all being combined into the stat power. This feels like, at first, a drop in depth and complexity, but it really isn't from D3 to D4, because in D3, those three affixes are absolutely meaningless. They all combine and effectively represent just power. In Diablo 2, they meant more and they did different things. But the power system is strictly an improvement over Diablo 3's system, which literally only served to make two-thirds of item drops useless to you on vanilla D3 release. In other words, if it didn't have your stat, the item was garbage. So rather than reintroduce stuff like strength, dexterity, and intelligence, which are the more common RPG tropes, they're bringing in these new affixes, demonic power, angelic power, and ancestral power. And this is also a way of capturing a degree of complexity with regards to item requirements. For instance, in Diablo 2, a big part of stat priorities involved basically getting just enough strength to wear all the gear you need it. In Path of Exile as well, we see an importance behind stat priorities. You need minimum levels to equip certain gear or skill gems. This is a very similar system, but is slightly less punishing because you can still equip the item. You're not locked out from using the item entirely, you're just locked out from certain stats on the item. In other ARPGs with stat requirements, you may find yourself in a position where you fiddle with your stats, you change one piece of gear, and then all of a sudden, whoops, I can no longer wear my helm. And that is something of a punishing system. Not to say that it's bad, but it is punishing. This is less punishing. You can still equip the item and benefit from it, but you can't fully benefit from it. And this feels very much in line with Blizzard's general ethos. Now again, my initial impression of this system is very positive, but I do have reservations at the back of my mind. This system needs to be handled with care because you don't want a situation where your end game is just, well, I need angelic power on every piece of gear. Because then again, we're not getting to a point where we're increasing choice, we're just again back to strength, dexterity, intelligence. The ideal implementation of the system would revolve around knowing that I need this minimum threshold of angelic power, so I need angelic power on this number of gear pieces, so on this gear piece I don't need angelic power, I can put another affix, and so you can be swapping around 
items, knowing that you only have to reach a certain threshold and it's not just the more you have, the better it is. And potentially even more interesting would be instances where you don't always just want to focus on one. Maybe Angelic is your primary, but Ancestral is a secondary, or they're tied and then you have a tertiary as demonic. And of course, the best scenario would be that different builds have entirely different priorities and degrees of split and thresholds to reach within each of these three affixes. Of course, all of that is fine tuning, but overall, first impression of the system is very positive. On to the next paragraph, attack defense changes. Based on your feedback, we've changed attack to only be found on weapons, defense to being only on armor, and we've removed both attack and defense from jewelry entirely. The goal here is to better embrace the fantasy of each item type. I believe prior to this, you had attack and defense pretty much on all items. The concern there was that attack and defense would just trump pretty much all other affixes such that, well, as long as you're seeing the numbers on attack and defense go up, you want to change to that item. And this is something that we tend to see in ARPGs that simplify attack and defense in this way. Going on, we like the attack and defense stats as a way to convey power progression on items. A core part of any ARPG is the quest for more power. Just as we have skill ranks, talent trees, character levels, and so forth, attack and defense allows us to reflect your power growth in items as well. To be clear, attack defense is not the end of the story of an item's power, but it does fulfill the easy to learn, difficult to master design philosophy by giving players a broad sense of whether the item is an upgrade. Players who are optimizing their character will still need to take the additional affixes on an item into account as their benefit to your build can outweigh the raw attack or defense of an item. Solely picking your items based on attack and defense will almost never be the optimal way to play, but it does provide a good starting point for newer players. It's important to reiterate here that items are just one part of a character's overall power. Our goal is to spread out power across different sources, including skill ranks, character level, talent trees, items, and the endgame character progression system, which is still in development. So again, all of this is good to hear as the design intent. We just have to make sure that the intent ends up being fulfilled in the execution. I would expect that the developers of those other ARPGs that do this attack defense system didn't intend for attack and defense to outweigh everything until endgame, but that often is the case. That is to say, while leveling up, before you are max level, the rule of thumb tends to be, well, if it has higher attack, you swap to it, regardless of the other stats or affixes on the gear. This is something very tricky to balance out because, of course, to a degree, you do want to be equipping higher level items as you level up. You do want to be upgrading your gear. But I think what you don't want to happen is if you have a level 7 sword and a level 8 sword drops, you will always take it because it will always have higher attack. And the level 9 sword drops and you will always take it because it will always have higher attack. And the level 11, etc. It's just that the next level of item is always better because it always has the higher stat. You want some threshold where you feel like, oh man, I got this really good drop. I can hold on to this for a few levels before I outlevel it. And then eventually, maybe five levels later, you're forced to make a decision, man. This item is really good, but now the attack on the new items is getting too high to outweigh the extra affixes that my current item has. But again, I'm totally cool with it seeming like something that a new player could just rely on as a safe bet every time. Alright, Ancient Legendary Replacement. We are going to remove Ancient Legendaries from the game in their current form entirely. Our newest proposal hits a couple different feedback points, addressing the usefulness of rare items, as well as increasing the depth and complexity of player gear choices in the endgame. We will be introducing a new type of consumable item. This item will be earned by killing monsters just like other items. It would have one random legendary affix on it, drops only in the late endgame, and can be used to apply that affix to any non-legendary item. This means a few things. 1. We create an elective mode for items that is experienced after players have had time to experience rare and legendary items normally, as well as familiarize themselves with a variety of affixes. 2. This adds a way to introduce new methods of play without adding even more power to endgame items. 3. Rare items with the best affixes on them are always useful and retain value. This is huge. It's also something that I feel falls into that easy to learn, difficult to master, or introducing depth granularly. As a newer player, you're going to deck yourself out in legendary items and feel great. But then if you want to take a step further, if you want to go into the next 
tier of play. That's when you realize you have to start hunting for specific yellow items with specific affixes for your specific build and gear composition that you can then put specific legendary affixes on that you hunt for. This is a million times more interesting than ancient items that are simply legendaries with higher stats. And what this is looking like this may mean would be that at end game, the highest level players, they're not going to be looking all the same, wearing all the same legendary items. They might have all the same legendary properties if they have similar builds, but at least their rare items should have distinctions between them. Of course, everything always comes down to how it is implemented, how things work out in practice, but in theory, I have a very positive impression of this system. David Kim ends by stressing that none of this is final and they want more feedback and they want to share more as they keep going. And so I encourage you folks to share your feedback in the YouTube comments here, on Reddit, on the forums. The devs are listening. Now is your opportunity to affect change. And that's going to wrap up this video, but do be sure to check out our video on everything we currently know about Diablo 4. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider pledging on YouTube or Patreon and unlocking behind-the-scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.